they almost all taste good sauteed. A little garlic, a little butter, a little onion, and the mushroom is fantastic. There are some mushrooms you don't want to eat by themselves. They're just too overpowering. The trumpet mushroom, that has a very strong commercial mushroom. It's like a can of mushroom soup, right? It's got a lot of mushroom flavor. You throw that in your eggs, it completely takes away the taste of the eggs. It overpowers the eggs. So not only knowing how to cook it, but also whether it's good in soups, whether it's good in next to your steak or in your salad, those kind of things. Probably the only rule of thumb, and our, our, our instructor will tell you the same thing. If you did happen to make a mistake and pick a mushroom that was toxic or whatever and it's going to make you a little sick, most of the time cooking it will remove the major portion of toxicity, if that's a word. So the rule of thumb, even though there is no rule of thumb, somebody will say, oh, if it has free gills and it looks like this and looks like that, it's always edible. Never, that's not the case. That's not how it works. But the, other, the, but the only rule that really applies is never eat a, a wild mushroom without first cooking it. Not so with plants. There's a lot of plants that are more leaf lettuce-y. There's a ton of like lettuce stuff, like the, the, the tall rattlesnake root, um, the aster, you know, those are all leaves that you can eat right off the ground. Uh, what about de dehydrating mushrooms? I know Rich does that a lot. Yep. So when you reconstitute them, do you have to cook them in, or is there a bond kind of... No, usually, usually the, you're going to, yeah, you wouldn't want to dehydrate a mushroom and then rehydrate it and eat it without cooking it. Now, Craig brings up a great point. The issue is all the mushrooms grow in a certain time of year, right? So September, October, what are you going to do with 45 gallons of chanterelles? You can't eat mushrooms every meal. Well, right. <laughs> Try it and you'll tell me. <laughs> so after a while, you're like, wow, but these mushrooms will go bad. So if you leave them in the fridge, we cook them and then vacuum seal them. So we boil them up, vacuum seal them, you know, drain the water off, vacuum seal them, put them in the freezer, pull them back out, put the butter in, uh, saute them up, throw them in the soup, and there you go. It's pretty cool when you look at your freezer and you know, okay, so <clears throat> I got ducks, goose, bear, moose, elk, deer, and then all my mushrooms, chanterelles, mushrooms, right? And you just start mixing and matching. Very, very cool. So learning how to either cook them and then freeze them or dehydrate them. Uh, you know, there, there's little tricks to each one. The black trumpet, if you dehydrate it, it turns into paper and <laughs> gone, right? So we cook them and then we put them in the bags and vacuum seal them. Okay, any questions on that? Because here we go, fasten your seatbelts. Ready? All right, here we go. Who's seen these? Is this, is this better with the, uh, let's see. Yeah, because then you don't have to look at me. Chicken of the woods. Fantastic. We found one in the neighbor's house. She just told me. I had to show them where it was. Mom was big. Chicken hands at the bottom of the tree. Yeah. Is it a hen or a chicken? Is it orange or is it kind of a grayish color? It's sort of a grayish color. Okay, so it's probably a hen. It's probably a hen, but at least I know now where it is. So every year I can go back to the same spot. Nice. Sometimes, yeah, it's, it's, it's really strange how a mushroom will grow on a tree one year and even though you're not taking the, the spore itself, you're just taking the fruit, sometimes it will come back and sometimes it won't. Like for instance, this one here, this was a 30 pound chicken of the woods. It was this big. When I cut that off, this is on the way up to uh, Monadnock, the, the hiking trails. When I cut that off, carrying it back to the truck, the water coming out of this mushroom was running off of my elbows. We cut the outer edges, which you'll find are the most tender, and we cooked that thing up, froze it, deep fried it. All, oh, it's unbelievable. Who knew that a mushroom could taste exactly like chicken? It's crazy. The texture, it's kind of stringy like chicken. So we make like 
chicken of the woods fries, right? You put them in the little, and you saute them up, and, and they're like this long, because we, we cut the ends off, right? And now, we do find that, as a side note, like this one is very young. See how bright that is? Like this is maybe a day, day and a half old. And then in a few days, it's going to get more like this, where it gets kind of bleached out. A few more bugs and other things crawling in. So this one was edible. Like this whole section was choice edible. This one here, only the outside rim, this little white section here is edible. This one here was almost gone by, so we just ate the tips and threw the rest of it away. This one's on an old dead cherry tree up in Boscoan where we bear hunt. And I was going in with a class one day, and he, that sticks out, right? Fluorescent orange, middle of the woods, it's like Pfft. So I cut a bunch off, I gave it to all the students, I'm like, this is a choice edible, no poisonous lookalikes, go for it. And boy, they came back and said it was fantastic. So, chicken of the woods, very easily recognized, definitely grows on old hardwoods, very, very common all throughout New Hampshire. Bear's tooth or lion's mane? We found this one in class. It was on an old beech nut tree that had snapped off and fallen and it was growing right out the side. The only tough part about these, and this is, a, this is one of the best eating mushrooms, cleaning them. Inside all these little, this one's a little bit gone by. See how it's kind of tan looking? See how bright white this one is? This one's probably a day old, this one's about a day and a half old, this one's probably four days old. But every little piece of dust and bark and everything else gets down into this thing and it's a real, kind of a real pain to clean. However, it's worth it. You slice it fairly thin and you, you know, just clean a piece that's about the size of your hand and then saute it. It's fantastic. All these pictures are taken during our classes. This is a comb tooth, so it's very similar to this one. Again, choice edible, no poisonous lookalikes, grows on the side of a hardwood. See, see the, this is the old stuff, and then the new stuff started sprouting up. You can even see some pine needles and some other stuff in there. This was actually underneath a log that had split and fallen down, so there's a gap in the log, and I just happened to look at down the log, and I could see this white thing down in the hole. Depending on the time of year, the, whatever the moisture content is just right, the, out they come. So I got my venison steak, thanks to my sons. A little olive oil. Drop it in the fry pan. It's crazy good. One of my favorites. Oyster mushrooms. Only on sugar maples. Only on sugar maples. You find an oyster mushroom and it's not on a sugar maple, it's not an oyster mushroom. You get them when they're this, this these are different times of years, or different times of the year. So this is a late fall oyster. See how brown, it's like a toasted marshmallow look? See how white this is? So September-ish, you have this. October-ish, you get into this kind of thing. And then these are called fall or winter oysters and they actually have a green look to them. So any of those oysters that you see there, would you eat the whole thing or just eat the... Nope, the whole thing. Absolutely, yeah. So here's how I was introduced to oyster mushrooms. My, so my friend George, I talk about him, he'll be here tonight. He says, ah, oh, he goes, I'm going to leave you something on your porch when you get home from work. I'm like, well, what is it? He goes, not telling you, just going to leave it on the porch. I show up and there's a tinfoil, a sandwich in tinfoil, and it's hot, it's still warm. So I pull it out and there's, a, there's an oyster mushroom about yay big, sliced the shape of the hoagie roll and there's maybe two or three of them and they're all like quick fried and they're inside this with a little bit of onion and some salt and garlic, whatever. Oh, man, I was like, oh. and it, the bread was perfect. I mean, you, you, till you try it, you won't know what I'm talking about. But an oyster mushroom, it's like a steak sandwich. It is, it is that good. Now, whenever you see an oyster, you know, now you're, you're carrying buckets. People are like, he's going deer hunting. He's carrying three five-gallon buckets. So, but so this is the other way, right? We cut them up in small, like, slivers, like French fries. 
Cut them off here, cut them lengthwise down the gills. Drop them in the fry pan. This one, again, sugar maple. I was in a hurry and couldn't pick those. I was devastated. I was running out. We were, we, where we bear hunt, it's in September, and that's when all the mushrooms are huge. So I see all these mushrooms, but I, I mean, I've got truckloads of mushrooms. What do I do? So I'm driving, well, I call a friend of mine and I, I Google, I snap Google him, whatever that is, snap face or face, snap yeah. ch chat face, whatever that is. And I send it over to him. And I, so he knows right where it is. Yeah, he went up there and he came to work the next day with a five gallon bucket of those fall oysters. Delicious. So here they are up close. So, so I'm in a deer stand. This is out at the end of Flag Road. And I'm, uh, I'm fixated on this mushroom, where I'm supposed to be deer hunting. And I, through, through the scope, I can barely see this white thing on this tree. And I'm thinking, it's not an oyster. And I'm thinking about calling it quits. And you know, ah, it's getting kind of late, but then I got to get down there and I got to still get out of the woods. So it does screw up your deer hunting. It'll mess you right up. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Funny thing though, so about 15 minutes before this picture, I actually shot a deer. I shot a little fork. And I let that deer go. And I went down and grabbed these pictures and took these mushrooms. And then I ran back up and tracked the deer and got the deer. So I got the deer and the mushrooms. Very cool, huh? That's the cake and eat it too thing. Right? It doesn't happen very often, but once in a while. But look how clean, huh? I mean, a little bit of dust here, a little brush. So, so that comes up a lot. How much washing do you do? I do almost no washing of my mushrooms at all. I take the mushroom and I use a brush, like a paintbrush, and just brush the dirt off. Mushrooms are a sponge in a sense, right? They're very porous. If you try to wash these real thoroughly, the water, now you're boiling off like tons of water that shouldn't even be there. So they make little mushroom brushes with a knife on the end. One side's got a brush and just, and then throw them right in the fry pan. Again, what kind of tree? Yep, sugar maple. This tree was dying, or had died, and the mushrooms, the spores, everything landed just right and augered in. There we go. Yeah. Very cool stuff. How many have ever picked chanterelles before? Last year, down here, not so good. Dry, not good at all. This was the year before, and we actually were picking chanterelles in August. It was one of those deals where it rained every night. It's the perfect, it was like the Garden of Eden, right? It was like raining at night, sunny in the day, rain at night, sunny in the day. It was fantastic. So chanterelle mushrooms, kind of a funnel-shaped deal. Put them in the colander. Anybody know what those are? Black trumpets. Yeah. Black trumpets. You put the two of those together. You won't eat at a restaurant ever again. Is there any poisonous lookalikes? No. Did no. Pumpkin, there is a false chanterelle. Jacqueline. Yes, but that's but other than the fact that they're yellow, it's the only commonality. Chanterelles always grow in ones and twos. Jack-o'-lanterns always grow in clusters, like bunches of them. That is the one that folks will call out that they think kind of looks alike. But if you've, if you've ever picked a chanterelle and then you, you see the jack-o'-lantern, you'll know it's just not even the same. The only thing they have in common is they're yellow. So this is the trumpet chanterelle. See the different color? Same deal, also highly, highly edible. And this is what they look like when you cook them up. Just delicious. I know, right? One of my favorites, lobster mushrooms. So I read about these because I'd seen them in the woods quite a bit. And I went out and I found some and I picked them, put them in the bag. On the way home, my son takes the bag and he goes, smell this. It absolutely smells like you have lobster in the bag. It smells like seafood. If you close your eyes and I didn't tell you the difference, you would swear that I had shellfish in the bottom of that bag. 
how does that happen? Like, how do we get a mushroom that tastes like chicken, that tastes like lobster? You, you, you cook this in butter, because everything's better with butter, right? Cook this in butter, it tastes like you're eating lobster. Crazy stuff. I don't know what it gets out of the ground that creates a shellfish smell and taste, but it does. Fantastic. Those, those mushrooms, do you find them in where, like a hemlock and hardwood? Yep. Soft, soft and hardwood? Yep, in a transition area. So big oaks and beech nut and maples mixed in with hemlocks, but always, well, I won't say always, 99% of the time on a trail. Like these, this is a well-worn trail right here. And they're hard to find because they, they grow underneath the leaves. You'll look down and you'll see a little hump of leaves like that. And when you kick the leaf off, that's sitting there looking at you. Very, very cool. It's got that top left picture. He, the needle, or sorry, top right. Yep. Um, it, so is it growing like horizontally, like towards the screen on the bottom there? Yep, it grows all kind of ways. Okay. This one's growing up like this. This one's kind of laying on its side. This one's growing off to the side. Look at the difference though. See how this is a young one and these are a couple days old. See how the bugs start to take the tops off? Yep. See how there's bugs. Yeah, see these two little bug holes right here? Yeah. Yeah, don't, don't be freaked out by a few bugs. Okay. Well, no. <laughs> My point is you can cut them out. <laughs> I mean, you can cook them. That's fine too. They're a little crunchy. Right? But... People will look at a mushroom and they'll say, oh, that's gone by, particularly the trumpet. If you have black trumpets, we'll get to those in it, but if you find black trumpets, don't, tell them. don't touch them. Don't tell you. Call me, no, don't tell you. and I'll no, take <laughs> I told that to one of the guys I work with. He goes, I think I have those down behind the house. I'm like, don't go near them. I'll come out and take them off your hands. I call them the black trumpets of death. It's number two in the choice edible. So morel being one, black trumpet being number two. So lobster mushrooms, no poisonous look-alike, smells like shellfish, grows in trails, hardwood, softwood transitions, very easily identified. A little bit tricky to clean, right? You know, you want to cut some of this stuff off, cut a little bit of the old stuff. But when they're white, white, white like this in the middle, it's a fantastic specimen. What's the issue with all these funnel-shaped mushrooms? What do we have to deal with? Everything lands in the funnel, right? So it rains and the dust and the, all this. So inside this funnel in here, you got to take a spoon and kind of scrape it and get all that gravel and dirt and stuff out of there. Ah. So who here drinks chaga tea? Yeah, it's unbelievable. So a damaged birch tree, only on a birch tree. Black birch, white birch, gray birch. No, not gray birch so much, but gold birch. This is a, a fungus and it has now become the rave. It's somewhere between 13 and $22 a pound. The white mountain where all the birch trees up there, it's become the thing, chaga hunting. If you see a guy with a machete, run, no. <laughs> but he's probably out looking for chaga. They, you know, guys are climbing trees to pull this stuff down because they can make two, $300 a day finding chaga. So I was a little skeptical, you know, kind of, eh, you know, the whole herbal, you know, medicinal, right? Wow, this stuff is fantastic. The tea, it's, it's like regular tea. You throw a little honey in it. It gives you, it really kind of, it's not an energy drink, right? It's not like Red Bull or Monster or whatever, but you can definitely notice a difference after you drink. It's not caffeine either. It's there's something else in it that really, it's just, wow. You just got a little bit of a zip, you know, it's, and there's no like drop off from like these energy drinks. So the doctors, of course, traditional medicine versus, so they're like, no, 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 no. Nope, you know, take Xanax, whatever it is for your, Prozac, whatever. So somebody finally decided they were going to call the bluff that this wasn't as good as what everybody says because people were, people had, you know, arthritis and some other things, and it seemed to be 
relieving some of their symptoms. Okay. So they broke it down chemically, ground it all up, got a chemist, broke the whole thing down. There are more antioxidants in a piece of chaga, the size of a half dollar. They were, un, it was, they were blown away. The concentrations of antioxidants in a, in a piece of chaga that gets boiled into tea, it was unbelievable, which was boosting immunities, which was doing another thing. No one's going to go out on a limb and say, oh, it'll cure anything, because it doesn't. But it does help with certain things. People with Lyme's disease have come back and said, I drink chaga every day now, and I'm noticing a difference in, you know, I'm not quite as tired as I used to be, you know, those sorts of things. One of my favorites, the cauliflower mushroom. Looks like a brain, right? This, this we, we lease a big piece of property in Loudoun, and this was out at the end of the property. There was a, on, just on the other side of this was an oak stump that got cut a bunch of years ago. Oh, well actually it's right here. And so, uh, again, what's the issue with this? Cleaning. Cleaning, it's a pain in the neck. It's worth it though, like look at all the little crevices and stuff in here, that all the little yeah, dirt and stuff. Yeah, well, yeah, so you cut it small enough and then you run it through, you know, the good news is this mushroom doesn't collect a bunch of water, so it doesn't saturate, right? You can hit it with a, ho with a sprayer, pretty high, high tech, and push the dirt and the bugs and everything out and end up with this. And then you saute that. This has like a, like a nutty flavor to it. It's like, it's like a hint of hazelnut, walnut, kind of, it's really interesting and it's delicious. It's fantastic. Again, choice edible, number six or seven, and no poisonous lookalike. There isn't another mushroom that looks like that anywhere, eastern, western, or otherwise, that has any kind of toxicity or is, is poisonous. Honey mushrooms. Anybody eat honey mushrooms before? When you find honeys. Yeah. Normally that's not why we went to the cave, but uh, there was tons of honey mushrooms down there. When you find honey mushrooms, it's like straight hitting the lottery. Now, I will say one out of 50 people that eat honey mushrooms have some kind of a, that doesn't feel right. It's, there's, it's just a weird deal. Our instructor, Rick, he's tried them every way. And he just, there's, at the end of eating a honey mushroom, he's just like, yep, there's that feeling again. It's got, just got a slight thing going on with depending on your makeup. But again, no poisonous lookalikes. It's got this really cool stalk that goes from white to kind of a bronzy look. And they grow in huge clusters. But they also grow, see how the yellow this is and how, kind of how brown this is? Same stalk. These are all, we picked all these during class. It was fantastic. These are beautiful. Look how young those are. Tender, hmm, fantastic. American Caesar. So they'll tell you this is part of the Amanita group, right? And they'll, which it is. Almost all Amanitas, psh, no good. Toxic, poisonous, no good at all. However, the American Caesar, there isn't another Amanita that looks like this. This is in the top four. I picked one up, up in Boston where we bear hunt, brought it back, had to class the next day, pulled it out of the bag, and the instructor went, that's a Caesar's. And I'm like, psh, psh, yeah, it's, yeah what you said. He's like, I said, is it edible? He goes, it's one of the best eating mushrooms out there. And I said, is, I said, I know it's an Amanita because it's got the bulb at the base and it's got the skirt here. I said, does it, what else looks like it? That's, he goes, nothing. There's no other mushroom that is red, red, red. And he goes, we'll cook it up. So we cooked it up for class and they're big. I mean, these things are like this, like pie plate stuff. Cooked it up. He was spot on. I've been, picking, I've been picking American Caesars forever now. My wife and I go up north for our anniversary every year. We hike the White Mountains and go into some waterfalls and stuff. 
and they have tons of these things along the edge of the trail. And can, you think you could see that from a distance? You would think. Oh yeah, you look down the hill and there's seven or eight of these giant red mushrooms, particularly if it rained a couple days ago. Keep, keep thinking about the weather as it relates to your vacation. If you're on vacation and it rained, like really rained a couple days ago or rained for a long period of time, you could be in for a mushroom bonanza. Now these, American Caesar, are they seasonal or can you pick them up spring through fall? No, nope, seasonal. Yeah, mostly depending on the rain quantity, August through October. Yeah. But have it, this is a cool little deal, huh? It looks like an egg. Yep. And then they grow out like that and then they get a little larger like this. You can just barely see this white kind of eggshell thing popping up. What's your favorite mushroom? Trumpet, black trumpet. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, don't touch them. No. <laughs> okay, hen of the woods. Base of hardwoods, mostly oaks. Every, you, you notice trees don't grow straight up. You ever notice that? They grow, they grow always like this way or a little bit that way. What happens is the water, I always wondered why the mushrooms always grow at the base of a tree in a certain spot. The water hits the bark, runs down the bark, and puddles in between the roots at the bottom, of, which is where the spores land, which is where your chickens and a bunch of other stuff grow, right in that little V section of root. We have an oak tree in Loudoun that fell all the way down. It broke off and fell down. All the water runs down the, bar the bark to the base of the tree and puddles at the bottom. These big heavy storms, there's lightning storms. And this grows there almost every year. Fantastic. Yeah, we don't talk about that one. Or that one, no, just kidding. Okay, so black trumpets. These things are really hard to see. Like, can you see them all in here? You can now because you're focused on it. If I were to take you in the woods and stand you in the middle of this, it would take you a second to focus. It's their, the color is so closely tied to the leafy matter that they are really hard to see. But once you see it, you can't unsee it. It's like you see them everywhere. I stood right in the middle and I said, so anybody see the choice edible mushrooms? And they're all like... I'm like, okay, look straight down. Oh, and then, oh, 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 oh. Right? It's pretty cool stuff, very camouflaged. Put this in rice, in with your steak. I eat. I can eat a whole plateful just just the mushroom itself. It's fantastic. It's a very strong mushroom taste, very commercial taste. This is one that they grind up into powder. They dehydrate them, grind them up into powder, and use them for seasonings and soups and stuff. Very very tasty. Any, any nope, nope, no poisonous lookalikes. So this is the separate, so here we go, chanterelles, right, on the left. And then, still in that transition, hemlocks, oaks, beech, hemlock, right, where the, it's kind of a cross between dark and light. A lot of wildlife like those little transition areas as well. But there's tons and tons of mushrooms. Puffballs. Yeah, yeah, huge puffballs. How do I know if a puffball is poisonous? Because there are pigskin puffballs and other poisonous puffballs. Yeah, you just cut them open. If they're white, like a potato chip, it's edible. If it's yellow, it was edible, but you've waited too long. If it's black, yeah, run for the hills. It's no good. But there's different types. There's the giant puffball, right? Like these, had we let them go, would have grown to be giant. Gem studded puffballs, and then the pear shaped puffballs. A lot of times growing on old logs, you'll see thousands of puffballs all the way down, little ones like about like that. These do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So underneath that should be some kind of a branch or a dead tree of some kind, just below the surface. So these are good, right? I've heard a guy, he said, I baste them in butter and put them in the toaster. Like a piece of toast. Put them on high cook and away you go. It doesn't take much to cook them. Very, very good. 
Okay, morels. Uh, this year was the year for me to really get into how to cook the inky caps. The issue with these is their shelf life is like five hours. You cut them, you take them home. If you don't cook them, they turn into mush. So you kind of got to cut them on the way out, go home and put them right in the pan. The only caveat with this mushroom, and, and there's a couple others, is, is if you drink alcohol with that mushroom, you'll get sicker than sick. Which I don't drink, so it doesn't bother me. But that, that's something that you should know. The inky cap is a very, the enzymes in the alcohol and the mushroom react, and you will get just, it won't kill you, but you will be really, really sick. So there are a handful of mushrooms that when you go looking into edibility, They'll actually caveat it by saying, choice edible, best cooked a certain way, never to be fused with, you know, eaten with alcohol or whatever. Old man of the woods. So this one wins the ugly award, right? You believe that is a very, very tasty mushroom? Yep, it is. Oh yeah, oh I've eaten them. Same, same thing, more into the softwoods than up in the hardwoods, but definitely along that edge. So morels, there's your spring mushroom. One of my all-time favorites is an aborted ontoloma. So funny thing about that mushroom, that is a parasitic mushroom. That mushroom is actually a mushroom that preys on poisonous mushrooms. And it is one of the best tasting mushrooms. This actually has like a, almost a sweet, sugary taste to it. It grows like a red rustula, for instance. If you try to eat a red rustula, first of all, it's super peppery. That's this one, okay? Very, very peppery. In fact, the Russians eat it, and they cut it up and drop it in their soups for, you know, for tasty side stuff. This mushroom actually attacks this mushroom before it ever breaks through the ground and kills it and grows the mushroom on top of the mushroom. And this mushroom, if you ate it, if I had a bucket of them in here, you would be like, I am gonna spend the rest of my life finding that mushroom. It is a fantastic mushroom. So brick caps, anybody eat brick caps? Nope. Super tasty, again. Okay, let's talk about some plants. We've got a few minutes here. Who thought, who would have thought common milkweed in your backyard could be a choice edible plant. It is, a choice edible. It is okay. phenomenal. No, see it? That's a that's an old wives' tale. Yep. A lot of people are like, oh, milkweed's poisonous. It's almost like an okra. Yes, it is. So, this was on my bucket list about five years ago. I, I had heard about it. You know, I read about the survival books and all that stuff, and people were like, yeah, yeah, you got to try it. You take a young pod like this and you saute, you cut it up like okra and you roll it in flour or whatever and, and you saute it, crazy good, crazy good. So two years ago, I went and picked a bunch of these flowers before they bloomed and I cooked them up, my family's gone. I thought, you know, I gotta try it. It was, it was like, Grade A broccoli, it's phenomenal. You have to try this if you don't try anything else off the slides. Go get your milkweed. Young milkweed pods, right? Yep, young milkweed pods before they do the whole feathery thing, right? Before they start getting that whole, because inside they're all choice, you know, easy to cut up and, and saute. <clears throat> By far, this is my favorite. So my mom and dad came over. I said, you gotta try this. And they're, they're old school. They're like, no, 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 didn't come from a grocery store. We don't eat it. I said, just try it. And if you don't like it, fine. You don't have to eat it. So I put the butter and the salt and pepper and I boiled them up. They cleaned me out. They, they were like, whoa, give me some more of that. What is it? And I said, just, I'll tell you after you're done. <laughs> so, it's, so it's milkweed. But it's in all of our yards. The state's full of it. It's crazy. So then... Somebody said, you should try it with the flour open. Well, I'm like, how do you cook that? They go, so mix up some Bisquick, dip the flour in the Bisquick and drop it in the fry pan or in the hot oil, like a fry daddy or something. And it's crazy. 
you, it will ch you, you'll never see a milkweed again the same way. <laughs> this is, this, of course, this has a real sweet smell to it. Of course, the bees love it, right? The, the honeybees or the, the bumblebees are all over it. If you dip that in some kind of a, a batter and deep fry that thing, it's crazy good. Crazy good. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's why the, we're running out of butterflies now. We're eating all the milkweed. Anybody recognize this plant? Yes. Dogwood bunchberry. The berry itself, everywhere in the fall. Very, very edible. A little seedy. Right? It's got a lot of seeds in it, but very sweet and very edible. Nothing else out there looks like that. Make a mistake. Dewberry. If you were to grab one of these leaves, you would see that they're all connected. It's like this vine thing that goes under the leaves. In class, somebody, he's, this instructor said, grab one of those and pull it. And it was like pulling the string on a guy's sweater, right? It just, it just goes and goes and goes, and they're all connected. Looks like a little bit of a blackberry or a black raspberry, but grows right on the ground. Very, very tasty. Wild strawberry. Man, there's a couple of places up north where we go brook trout fishing, and the old skitter trail, it's very sandy. There are giant, well, giant by nature's size, right? Not like commercial size, but fan, we, well, we, I mean, brook trout, strawberries. Uh. Anybody recognize this? So grab a handful of those. What's the thing with these things? The seeds. But you put them through a strainer, put a little sugar in there to take away the tartness, because it's pretty tart, and some of the best jellies you can imagine. We grew up on this, choke cherry jelly. Very, very common. They're everywhere. High bush and low bush blueberry. This was taken out on the property that we leased down by the bog. One year, just the whole side of the bog was all high bush blueberries. You could just stand right there and pick them like this, big ones. Blackberry, black raspberry. Certain times of the year, you've got all you want, all the edibles you can imagine. You know what, how do you tell the difference between black raspberry and blackberry? Anybody know? Good. So blackberry, giant thorns, right? Look at the difference in the color of the stalk, of the stem. So this year, new challenge, grab a blackberry stem, knock the, the thorns off it, and just chew it. Tell me if it's not the best thing you've ever done. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's fantastic. It's got like a nutty flavor to it. It's, real, it's got a sweet kind of a nutty flavor to it. Oh, it's fantastic. I do recommend taking the thorns off, though. <laughs> but it's really, really delicious. Yeah, so notice the difference. See how it's very green, very, but no, notice how this very opaque look. But berries are obviously just as good. Elderberry. One of my favorite, wintergreen. Now, is there a lookalike for the elderberry? Yes. There yep. Is that one poison? There's like three lookalikes for elderberry. Now, if you look at the leaf pattern, and the pattern that the berries grow, it's unmistakable. But are there other purple berried plants? Absolutely. In clusters. Check the leaf pattern. The berries can kind of grow in the weird, they can do all kinds of things. They can grow in, in like grape-like clusters, mm -hmm. or they can grow, like this is like the grape-like cluster deal. But this leaf pattern is unmistakable. Opposing leaves. Good stuff. Make teas out of this. Anybody grab a, uh, we do this in our class because just, just for fun. Yeah. You, you, you take it and you tear it and then you hand it around and people are like, really? Oh, oh that smells like lifesavers. It's, it's wintergreen. That's what it is. It's delicious. And then these berries come out late in the fall and 
If, if you can get a whole handful of them and eat them, it's delicious. Do the deer like the elderberry? Yeah. Yeah, the deer, raspberries, blackberries, they'll eat almost any of that stuff. What's that? Yeah, they'll eat them all. Yep. Here's an overlooked one. Nope, dandelion. Yep, straight. That's dandelion root. Okay. Pretty fun stuff. Go dig up some dandelions this spring. Dandelion roots. Put them in the oven or in the dehydrator till they get solid. Grind them up. Coffee. It's poor man's coffee. It tastes just like coffee. It's fantastic. Now this is this is what we like. So we eat the greens before the flowers. You you cut these early on, right as the, right after the snow goes away, and they everything starts turning green. Dandelion greens, butter, so, yeah, it's like spinach. Butter, salt, pepper. Great stuff. Fairly small window though. You ever notice that? You yeah, drive by the farm field. One day the no flowers, the next day the flowers. Oh, I'm done. The whole field is yellow. Yeah. And you missed it. It's yeah. now this is bitter. These will oh, be yeah. really bitter. Yeah. So at that point you go to the root and you just deal with the root. But dandelion root, dried, crushed, and steeped or boiled is is absolutely a coffee derivative it's got a lot of coffee flavor to it this is the one that causes everybody to go off the road so they come to the class and we go pick a bunch of these lily pods this instructor cooks them all up now we're driving down the road and there's a lily pod you know it's like there's just rows and rows of people's gardens with lilies all these lily pods are absolutely fantastic don't don't do tiger lily, just do a regular lily, like the day lily. Now, what's the, the tiger lily has a lot more spots. It's spotted the whole way. Okay. Yep. You know, I've got, I've got both in my yard. You have both growing in the same place. That's unusual. Oh. Yep. The tiger lilies, see this has a few spots down low. Tiger lilies have spots all the way. It's a very heavily spotted plant. Yeah, those don't have a lot of spots on them. So you could be all day lilies. Yeah. But, you know, one of the... What brings something to you? Yeah, yeah. One of the, one of the advantages these days, we have Google Images. Right now, not, don't trust Google Images for your ed choice edible stuff. However, if you type in tiger lily and you type in day lily, you'll very quickly, through looking at dozens and dozens and dozens of photos, start to see what the differences really are. Elderberry is the same way. If you type in elderberry and then type in, you know, one of the other purple berry type plants, instantly, you, oh, well, this one has a leaf pattern like this and it grows yay high. And the other one grows yay high, and you know, so you start to see the differences. Use as many, probably if I were to give you one piece of advice, use as many sources as are readily available to you. In other words, if you have a, if you have a book, that's not enough, right? If you have two books, that's better. If you have two books plus the internet, that's even better. Because you want to see these things from every angle, yeah. top, bottom, Cut the stem. For instance, I found a blood mushroom. And I thought, is that a blood mushroom? So I went through the whole gamut of, you know, if it turns red when you cut it, if it does this when you do it, when you cook it, does it change color? At the end of the day, I still was kind of like, ah. So I emailed it to my instructor, and he popped it back and said, definitely a blood mushroom. One of the top 20 choice edibles. Good for you for finding it. And... I've been eating blood mushrooms now for two years. Okay, cattails. We, we grab these in class. Sorry to interrupt you, but did you have a picture of a blood mushroom earlier? No. No. What's cool about a blood mushroom, though, when you find one, when you cut it and turn the stalk over, it's pure white. In about 10 minutes, it's blood red. The whole thing is blood red. Has anybody heard of a beefsteak polypore? Yeah. 
So a beef steak polypore, it bleeds like a steak. You cook it, you kick a beef steak and you throw it in, and as you cook it, it looks like it's bleeding like a steak and it tastes like beef. And there's no poisonous lookalikes. Now, they're not that common here. I mean, if you find one, that's great, but at least where we mushroom hunt, I, I've only found maybe a half a dozen beef steak polypores. But they do, when you, you, you read the book, you go, oh, it bleeds when you cook it. Next thing you know, you're cooking it and it's like, it looks like a steak. Fantastic. Huh? Fiddleheads. Fiddleheads. There you go. Not common in this part of New Hampshire, but north, like up in the Connecticut River Valley. Great, great eating. Only in the spring and kind of a narrow window. You show up and they're still in the ground and then you show up a week later and they're ferns this high. They're not edible. Yeah, yeah. Is there something else that looks like those? Yeah. Yes. There's a ton of other ferns. Sensitive, American, bracken, all these ferns. But there's one distinguishing difference. Do you see this channel? Yep. There's a channel. Looks like celery. Yep. The other ones don't have that. Okay. And if they do, it's not pronounced. This has an absolute celery. I've seen some of those on a road next to our house. Yep. Yep. A bracken fern. It, it, South Korea, I didn't know this until I started looking at it. South Korea has a huge stomach cancer issue. Who knew? A lot of it comes from the fact that they eat bracken fern. I'm in the Aziskahas area, Rangeley area, and there's an oriental lady next to the road, and she is picking just as fast as she can, filling her buckets. And I stopped and I asked her, I said, what are you picking? And I really didn't understand what she was saying, but she was saying bracken fern. Well, I asked my instructor, I said, can you eat bracken ferns? He goes, if you don't cook it just right, like blanch it and this and this and this, there's enough cyanide, I think, or chemical, there's some kind of a deal in that that takes out your stomach lining. And so, but it's, they eat it in such large quantities that that's what does it. He goes, you eat it once, ah. Eh, he goes, we just stay away from it. When there's fiddleheads around, why would you bother with bracken or any of the other ferns? So just look for this really deep celery type channel. Get them when they're tight. We did these on the grill. There's a brook trout under there somewhere. And we did these in the saucepan. And it, I don't know, I don't even know how to describe it. It's fantastic. All right, some of the other edibles that are in your yard, wood sorrel, red clover. You can eat this flower right off the plant. Yep, it's very sweet. Anybody know what, ha what this is about, what these? These are up around the flower to start. This is a very cool thing. When a bumblebee comes along and pulls the nectar out of here, it opens up and actually gives the next bee a place to land and pull. Oh, really? How cool is that? So when you see that these are down, a bumblebee has been here and has pulled out a bunch of the, whatever they're looking for, pollen or nectar, whatever. And it creates a little platform so that they can pollinate and do their whole thing. I mean, really, it's genius, genius. So that's pretty cool. We, we, uh, we bring that up in class every year. Yep, yep, you can eat that leaf right off the plant. Same thing with this one. I like a little Italian dressing on mine, but good stuff. Sheep sorrel, anybody eating that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty sour. Yeah, yeah, there you go. A lot of this stuff growing in your yard that are, that are, it's just, you wouldn't, like, you wouldn't cook this, it would turn to mush. But you would eat it in a salad, mix it in with greens. There's a lot of greens that you can throw together and create choice edibles. Oh, well, let's see. Okay, here we go. So yarrow, got a good medicinal quality. Poison ivy. Here's what's cool about poison ivy. Generally, within proximity is this plant. Anybody know what this plant does to this plant? Children. 
Yep, it neutralizes the effects of poison ivy. So you go down this old logging road and you look and the hole, it's covered. Poison ivy, you look over here, it's all jewel weed. Which is, this is that snap, what do they call that snap? Yeah, snap dragon. So you got the little seeds, when you pinch them, they kind of explode. If you grab this and mush it all up, or even if you boil it, like with just a little bit of water, it turns into kind of a balmy, savvy stuff, and you put that on fairly soon after you've been in contact with poison ivy, it'll absolutely neutralize it. Beaked hazelnut. Anybody seen those? Down by the bog. Yep, you pull this apart and you get the nut in the middle and you cut the nut in half and pull it out of the, out of the shell. It's, it is like the hazelnut coffee you drink. It's fantastic. Arrowroot, uh, one of our favorites is Indian cucumber. See this little thing here? But there is a poisonous one that looks like that, right? This? There's a star flower that looks like it. It's not poisonous though. It doesn't have this though, I don't believe. This is, the Indian cucumber is delicious. This one will be stacked. You'll see another one with another flower out the top. Okay. Yep. yep. And then your pond lily, which is you eat the tuber on the bottom. Very starchy, a lot like potato. Good stuff. Moose like those. Beaver like those. Mushrooms class. Edibles class. Sky found chaga. Shinnied up to the top of this tree. It's in the liability waiver, no tree climbing. But he climbed all the way to the top and he hacked off this giant piece of chaga. So he's set for life on that. Is it usually high up the tree? Is that high? No. We no. Found, we found it always lower. It was, we a, it was a dense in a tree and we found it above the side. Okay. I looked at it and I said, Scott, Scott, look. See, there's another. Go grab it now. I said, what? I said, chaga. And so they're all like, what's chaga? I said, and then they're all looking oh, for it. That's what I'm talking Yeah. <laughs> Chaga grows on a damaged tree. So very common where skitters have gone by and the, ch the tire chains have taken the bark off. That's when the, the spores go into the bark and then create chaga. The issue with chaga is even though it is a fungus, once it's gone, it's gone. If you take a piece of chaga off a tree, it won't grow back. So we always recommend, I mean, this, that right there, that's a four year supply of chaga tea. Like you could boil a piece of that like that four or five times yeah, and get all the tea out of it that you need. That chunk we have is That's a lot of chaga. Yep. It's very cool. So that's it for the class for this class.